Hey folks, it's T Tuesday. Uh, Sharp-eyed viewers will have noticed, like David Kiersey did last month, that I did not actually have any goals for this update. It didn't even uh, say that I was going to be here, but here we are. Uh, uh, the main thing, of course, was getting the Living Computation Theory of Everything video out. Uh, uh, here's what I've been thinking about. Uh, um, come on, there we go. So I want to talk about uh, the video a little bit. Uh, take a moment to look back on the challenge that's just done uh, and, and stick myself with a new one. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, so, living computation theory of everything, you know, uh, on the negative side, you know, it's still too hard to follow. It's still preaching to the choir where the choir consists primarily of me. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I've been trying to say this stuff for a while, and, I, and, and this current version is, is definitely the most coherent one yet. And the defined defendant attack where I say things, uh, objections that people might raise and then say how I would respond to them, I think it actually helps quite a bit for people to get a handle on uh, where what I'm saying actually is. And one of the things that I kind of like about the way that it all finished up was how it, it really centers humans, humanism, and humanity uh, uh, rather than, you know, the cold world of protons and, and, and submesons or whatever it is. Uh, skip the part about the demo at the moment, but it's both good and bad. Okay. Uh, um, so the f first half of this year was supposed to be this multicellular challenge. It didn't start out as a multicellular challenge. It started out as a digital replicator. Uh, and this was our master plan that we looked at uh, many times. The, the mother, little diamond with some code in it, it would grow bigger, it would move the code around, it would copy the code, and eventually it would cut. And then we would end up with, with two uh, uh, completely legitimate mothers that would go on to do the same thing. And that is the recipe for unicellular life. There's nothing saying in this picture saying that these two things are supposed to team up and do something, but we actually did get to that. Uh, uh, so multicellular challenge, challenge met zero to multicellular in six months. I mean, that's not too bad, you know, for a small project. And, you know, there are many uh, other pieces of work that have been done over the years and decades that have much in similarities uh, to what we did here particularly. Uh, but in its details, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely really the first of its kind in the world. And, you know... Okay, that's that's a little bit of something. I personally, you know, learned a ton. Uh, uh, and I thought about all of these things that, you know, when you don't have global architectural synchronization, you need to have self-organizing local synchronization. And how you do that, there's lots of different choices and the ring oscillators and the gradients and all that stuff. But going through the diamond replicators and then the multicellular stuff, you know, really sort of made it built it in to my thinking. It's it's not something that I have to think to apply. It's just, you know, okay, uh, how big is this thing going to be? So how much delays are we going to be talking about? What kind of scaling do we want to do? And, you know, it is pretty, you know, I've gotten awful used to it, but it is pretty cool to watch. On the other hand, uh, uh, there's way too much physics and not nearly enough chemistry and biology in the model for my taste. Uh, you know, there's a, a just enough to make it, you know, non-trivially biological. Uh, uh, but the bigger problem is that the model itself, the whole idea is too thin from its smallest component to its biggest component is not thick enough. Uh, uh, you know, a single atom an entire diamond, which is meant to be a replicator, you know, like a cell or something like that, is only a couple of thousand atoms. So, so that's like three orders of magnitude from the smallest thing to the thing that's supposed to be a replicator. Whereas, you know, in, in our actual real physics, uh, you know, the absolute teeniest replicators are in billions of atoms and then on up. And because we are so thin, because we have so little space uh, between the, el the elementary particle and the creature, uh, there's just no room to store, you know, giant sequences of DNA. You can do that when you have billions of atoms in a single replicator. You can't do it when you have thousands of atoms, most of which are spoken for. 
In addition, there are still lots of fragilities in the code. HC3, hard cell 3, the fundamental grid that made all of the mobile uh, diamond stuff possible, still has deadlocks in it, and rah, 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 rah. Uh, uh, it, the code is, is hard to work with. It's slow to build. It's slow to run. And, I mean, I did work. I did push pretty hard uh, on the, the diamonds over the, you know, last four months or whatever it was, the, over 2023, really. And uh, I'm a little sick of them. <laughs> I want to do something else. So, uh, um, new challenge. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by showing uh, a little clip from Living Computation Theory of Everything and use that to set up the new challenge. Uh, uh, okay. Now. How are we doing on our second implementation? In fact, in my mind, in my heart, the T2 Tile project is working on a second implementation. But, you know, how far is the uh, T2 Tile project from being able to respond to code like this and do anything? It's a zillion miles away. And so, you know, that's why it's an IOU. So that's it. Uh, um, the T2 tile, the MFM, has a lot of good stuff. It's spatially distributed. It doesn't presume determinism, so on, so on, and so forth. It's indefinitely scalable. Uh, uh, but there's no way anytime soon we're going to be able to go from atoms to uh, on up the scale and get as far as, you know, us. Just, just no way. Uh, um, so one idea is uh, let's move the model to a different area of space-time. Let's regroup. Uh, uh, and in particular, what if the T2-tile matrix, the entire matrix, however big it is, currently 76 tiles and stuff, uh, was all meant to be just a little patch of brain. And the body and the connection between the body and the brain is outside the grid, outside the matrix. That's what I want to go for. T2 matrix meets world. So, you know, I tell people, they ask me, what's the killer app for this? When am I going to be able to run an Excel on uh, the, the T2 tiles? And it's like, you know, no time soon. And my response, it traditionally is robust system control. Robust real-time system control is what the T2 matrix style of computation, the bottom-up, the distributed, the robust, is good for. Because you really, if, if the system that's being controlled is the life and death of that system, you know, then yeah, you really do need it to be robust. You really don't want to be thinking about penny pinching efficiency if the, a failure of the system takes out the whole thing. Uh, um, so, but of course, uh, the T2s are so slow and so forth, we can't connect to the real world. So the idea is we're going to have some kind of simulator over here that's going to simulate something. Uh, um, but we have to figure out how to connect the T2 matrix to that something. And we'll be able to crank down the speed on the simulated world to match the incredibly slow speed on the T2 tiles, and we'll see what happens. So tons of questions that I mostly am not ready to give good answers to yet, but figuring that out is part of the task of the challenge. You know, what is the system that's being controlled? What is the world that the system is in? How to connect the T2 matrix to the world and how to deal with real time and so forth. I'm going to focus on how to connect T2 matrix to the real world because that's kind of logically prior. Before we can do anything, we have to figure out how we're going to get IO in and out of the matrix. So one possibility is, right, you know, so here's a T2 tile. This is the west edge of the T2 tile, and it's got a uh, an Ethernet port right there. Uh, and you can only get to the Ethernet port if the west edge of the tile isn't covered up by another tile. But we could uh, connect uh, to all of the western tiles. Uh, uh, we could plug in an Ethernet cable, put them all into a hub, and then network our way to the computer that's running uh, whatever the world and the system that's being controlled is. And, you know, we could do this today, uh, at least in a small version. I'd need to get a bigger switch later on. Uh, um, but I'm really not satisfied with it. Um, it's, you know, one edge seems very arbitrary. Originally, I'd been thinking that, you know, we'd have an interface all around the edge. 
uh, of the matrix. But when I started thinking about it as being like a patch of brain, I, I really wanted to talk to the whole thing. I, I mean, just like we have the spinal cord coming in and hitting uh, cor cortex in the surface of the brain and so forth. And there is a possibility of how to do that. So in addition to the Ethernet port, there is a serial port, a UART, uh, on each tile that is accessible from the front. So even if we have those things all tiled up, in principle, we can get at a serial port on each, U, on each T2. That's what this sketch is drawing here. These are serial cables. And then we have something, uh, magic happens, and then all of those serial ports connect to the computer that's running the simulation. And so I started figuring out, you know, what the heck could go in here? I mean, so like here is four serial ports going into a USB. And so the idea is like, you know, we could get like, uh, uh, you know, 30 or 40 of these or something, uh, or no, 25 anyway, to get to like 100. And then we would have to get U USB hubs, daisy chain together, feeding them together. This, I, I cannot, uh, <laughs> I cannot imagine letting myself try to do that. Uh, um, another approach uh, is an actual rack server thing. This thing has got 32 serial ports that it puts them all down onto one ethernet port like that cost-effective serial concentrator. So it would take like three of these uh, uh, to um, get enough serial ports to talk to all of the T2 tiles. Now, maybe we don't have to talk to all of them, but I'd like to. Uh, um, and, you know, uh, I could go to the hardware uh, dealer people, you know, Mouser is one of the ones I'm sort of comfortable with, and I could buy, I could buy it today. Uh, uh, and they're 20 <laughs> $600 a pop. So cost effective in this land means less than $100 per port. So, <laughs> you know, if this was really a great solution, then, you know, maybe the money would be tolerable. But uh, there are other issues that I have. I'm not really su super happy about it. Well, then there's this thing. The AM335X supports up to six additional UARTs. Well, so what? Who cares? Well, because the AM3, AM335X is what's inside the T2 tiles. Now, we can't use those UARTs on the T2 tiles because the pins are already doing other stuff. But if we, this is a BeagleBone Green, this is the processor that's inside of every T2 tile. Underneath this uh, uh, heatsink here is an AM335X. So we could maybe do a new little bit of circuitry, a new little bit of programming, and get a, uh, have one of these that would have six. And now it's possible that there could mean have four others and end up actually, it says six additional, that in principle that could be on top of four. So one of these might be able to take 10 serial ports. Again, it wouldn't necessarily be able to take them all at super high speed, but this is the good thing about this particular task. Everything is so slow that we don't need to max out the serial port speeds. Uh, because everything is going to be so far clocked down to compensate for the slow average event rate of the T2 tiles. So a dozen of these, maybe, uh, uh, maybe 10 could cover the whole thing. I've got that sitting in the stock right now that, uh, you know, uh, Eagle Bone Greens that haven't yet been attached to T2 tiles and so forth. So this is the idea, BBG, Beagle Bone Green. I wrote it as taking six UARTs each. So we would have like a dozen of these or something. They would each have an uh, Ethernet cable that would go to a switch and then would go in. The serial port concentrator. I'm going to go for this. I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, we'll see. So uh, uh, this is what we're talking about. It's the T2 Matrix Brain Challenge. Not human brain. Uh, not even, uh, you know mouse brain. It's some tiny, tiny, tiny little stimulus response, just the, the barest minimum sort of thing. Uh, uh, and I've made up a schedule. This was the hardest part of the whole thing was to actually pin myself down. So we are already right now is matrix brain challenge T minus six counting down by T Tuesday updates. So there is not going to be a update in November because once again, I'm going to do nano nano Remo, the national novel writing month. In this case, it's not even close to trying to write a novel. Instead, it's going to be to bring out the collected works of Von Joy Manon, uh, which will include the science fiction story, search quiet wake that I was trying to sell the other months, the other months and years back, uh, um, and we'll take it from there. 
and we'll cover all of this stuff, Breitenberg vehicles, sensory motor homunculus, as we go forward. And that's the plan. Serial port concentrator demo, collected works out, have a lot of fun. Thanks so much for stopping in. I hope to see you in December.